Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Mark Newman. Mark, are you ready to join the mission? Yeah, let's do it. We're going to do something different. I want to introduce you to the audience first, and then I'm going to ask you your first question. So let me do that. Mark Newman, CIO and founder of Constrain Capital. He is, like myself, a CFA charter holder. He's creator of the ESG Orphans Index. He's a 30-year Wall Street veteran, formal glo former global equity derivatives trader with Merrill Lynch, Susquehanna, Jones Trading, Baycrest Partners. He's a former event-driven hedge fund partner. His recent investment project, well, ladies and gentlemen, he has spent 1,000 hours of deep dive into all things ESG over the past six years. And his goal is to deliver truth in ESG, to protect and help investors make informed decisions with measurable results when understanding risk and reward. So um, let's, why don't we start off, Mark, just tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. So I've uh, always been a student of the markets and I've really found my passion in digging in and finding, getting to the bottom of the story and helping investors and myself to, you know, understand situations and really get a good, uh, get my arms around risk and reward. Mm. And, 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 and I pride myself on making sure that those people I come into contact with and talk about in investments um, understand at least the way I see it. You know, it's not always going to be the right view, but it's always going to be clear and straightforward and uh, no, 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 uh, no pulling, no punches. I was thinking about the heart of an analyst. You know, I always tell students in my valuation masterclass that um, the minute I sat down as a job as an analyst in 1993, I just knew this was for me. And the beauty of the financial markets is that it could possibly be the last place in the world where dumb ideas get destroyed. You know someone out there who has a dumb idea about, you know, something in life. You know, they, they may think, okay, my idea is that I can fly. Go ahead and try it and you'll find out. But the point is, is that many people exist with dumb ideas. And there's people are now allowing that to persist. And the stock market is where you can go in and you bring your dumb idea and someone else takes your money away from you. Uh, and so I just think when I listen to you talk and we talked a little bit before this, you know, I hear the heart of an analyst digging deep into a topic. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always, like I said, prided myself in uh, do, doing the deep dive and turning over the rocks. And, you know, there are some folks who sort of want to, want to find a, a, an outcome or a result before they dig into something. And so they'll see things in a certain way or, or in a certain light based on what I'd call a little bit of bias going in, where I always just sort of, what's my gut reaction? What's my instinct? And does this change help or distract from my thesis on the idea? And that's sort of, you know, my idea behind the ESG orphans and, and, and sort of my approach to ESG was uh, based on, you know, I, I just, I started realizing that it was pervasive and becoming a real, you know, the, the driving force, the theme in the markets. And I think over the last decade, it's taken seat one, the front seat, the lead seat, if you will, on things driving, driving the investment markets uh, these days. So I have a message to all the listeners and viewers. I'm going to, you know, give it very important warning, warning, independent and objective thinking about to occur. Okay, now we can talk because under CFA Code of Ethics, we are actually required to think independently and objectively. In fact, I'll be teaching my EF, my uh, Ethics in Finance course today at university where I teach the CFA curriculum on 
ethics. And one of the key, key things is to be independent and objective. So ladies and gentlemen, the one thing about independent and objective is that it is often discomforting. So, yeah, it's the critical thinking is key. And like you said, Andrew, it does it does sometimes make some people squirm because they don't want to hear the, the the sort of harsh reality of things as they as they exist in real life, in real time, real life. And so in this case, um, what I've decided is that we just don't have enough time to go through your story and ESG. So I think we're going to spend another time talking about your story. But for today, first thing I'd like to do is for you to explain what is constrained capital and ESG orphans. What are you doing? What's your business? Okay, so um, constraints on capital uh, is a, a, a pattern that exists in the market uh, based on policy, based on investment themes and philosophies. And most recently, ESG has been the biggest example of constraints on capital. And I want to just take a little step back. And, you know, I came across the idea of constraints um, in, in, in finance, reading a paper by a guy called Cliff Asnes of AQR. He wrote a piece in May of 2017, Virtue is its own reward. One man's floor is another man's ceiling. And he talked about constraints on capital causing misallocation and uh, malinvestment in general, starving certain industries and 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 flooding other industries uh, based on you know let's call them uh, less than scientific reasoning, so to speak. So, for example, in ESG, we saw that constraints were heavily implemented on fossil fuels, nuclear energy, weapons. Uh, the other, those are the newer, what I call woke, shame stocks, if you will. And then the other three sectors are the old sin stocks, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. Basically, ESG said those are bad for E or the S or the G, whatever it might be. And then on the other side, the sort of malinvestment, misallocation of capital, they chose certain winners that were apparently good in ESG. Now we could dig into the ESG rating systems and, and the inconsistency of it all, which is part of my research, but you know, technology, for example, saw a lot of inflow. That was misallocation of capital on the other side of constraints or constraints in a sort of different way, where say for just for example, real quick, Amazon, it ranked very high and it is in 80% of ESG funds, but it has a huge carbon footprint. It's not friendly to the unions and working conditions aren't that great. So it's a great company perhaps, but it's not ESG. So in the end, those constraints push capital to one place, starve capital to another place. And my orphans, my ESG orphans index was those six sectors, fossil fuel, nuclear energy, weapons, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling that were routinely excluded. I was the only consistency in all of my research that I found in in ESG. I looked at the funds, I looked at what they did, philosophies, uh, uh, methodologies, and the only thing consistent was what they all excluded, which was this basket of orphans, the ESG orphans index that I created. And so <clears throat> are you, you created this because you just said, hey guys, there's just something going on in the market. And for some reason, uh, these guys are being cut off and therefore as they're being cut off from capital, the value of these stocks falls and then they're in a great investment opportunity. Or is this an anti ESG uh, fund? I mean, or ETF or what, what, what is it? Well, it's an index now. Um, it's an, in, it's an index. And so um, first of all, the, one of the themes that Cliff Asnes talked about was, higher expected return securities, the idea of the sort of scarlet letter stock. For someone to own a stock that they could get ostracized for, that they could get made fun of or, 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 or shamed, if you will, there has to be a higher expected return for them to want to hold that. Mm. So that's the idea of these exclusions, these ones where all the capital flowed in over the past decade to all those sectors, excluding mine. Right, excluding the or the index. So, for example, in in the in the last decade, up through twenty twenty one, let's call it the infotech space in the S and P five hundred, it grew from eighteen percent weighting to thirty six, and the energy sector shrunk from about ten nine ten percent down to two and a half in November of twenty twenty one. So, I just looked at it from and all those 
let's just call them, you know, uh, energy. So uh, energy sector, um, industrials, sort of with the the weapons. We can call it uh, aerospace, but let's. Hmm. And then um, uh, alcohol, tobacco, you know, are sort of like eh, staple, sort of. But those all shrunk over the past decade because of these flows. And ESG contributed, whereas info tech, the the apples of the world, and the healthcare space really blew up and bloom. And so I looked at it as, you know, when you see the guy at the circus tying the balloons, he makes a poodle and the one end is the little head and then the body. I looked at all the ESG orphans, the exclusions as that little head and the all the other stocks, Apple, Google, Microsoft, App, Amazon, big tech allocations in these ESG funds as the big body. Mm. And so my my indication was over a longer period of time, we're going to see a reversion. In addition, those sectors, fossil fuel, weapons, they became so cheap on a relative basis. So the index itself screens as nice dividends, great cash flow, relatively very cheap, and part of the exclusions where my my thought is, as that pendulum shifts and ESG gets called out, which it has recently some, and it's mm. starting to, you're going to see reversal of flows. Mm. And flows are going to go back to those names that were excluded. And that's part of the theme and thesis behind the ESG Orphans Index. And um, one question that pops out of my head is that um, I would like to think that capital has been uh, taken away from uh, defense contractors. But I mean, is that the case that that sector has underperformed? I mean, I, I when I think about all of my ESG friends out there and I say, you know, like, uh, if you stopped allocating money to defense contractors today, they would not be able to do business to some extent or invest. And therefore you could stop the war and the war was, you know, that's going on right now in Ukraine uh, is the ultimate destruction of human life, which is the S wouldn't you want that? Right. So that's a great point, Andrew, the idea that these weapons are a deterrent, right, to despots around the world, you would hope. But interestingly, weapons have been on the uh, orphans, the exclusions, no, that's not ESG. So many who are ESG full-throated supporters um, are supporting the Ukraine, mm. too. But they can't even technically invest in those companies that are getting the hundreds of billions of dollars. Look, unfortunately, the reality is when we give a hundred billion to the Ukraine, they're not buying McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Mm. They're buying weapons. So that's the irony of the, the 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 weapons aspect of ESG because everyone wants deterrence. We don't want um you know we don't want Vladimir Putin running crazy, but the ESG investors can't even buy the beneficiaries of those weapons. Uh, purchases. And now you had asked the question, I want to just take a quarter yep. step back. You asked about the anti-ESG nature. So it's anti-ESG factor. Yes, sir. As an investor, this factor has become a massive bubble. Mm. But as it personally, I grow my own vegetables. I grow my own herbs. My son spent time in Peru planting trees in indigenous villages last summer. So I, and I'm an outdoorsman and in my house, we haven't had plastic bottles for a decade, swell bottles, hydro flasks. That's how we roll. Yeah, exactly. Glass bottles, much better. So, you know, for me, everyone's like, oh, you're anti ESG. No, no, I'm anti the ESG bubble as an investor, as a CFA charter holder saying this has gotten too crazy. There's major value in a lot of these companies that have been discarded. Look, in the end, I think we need future energy different plan. I agree. But we can't take some uh, quantum leap and abandon fossil fuels and just say, oh, we're going to get by on the wind and batteries tomorrow. That's just people are going to starve. People are going to freeze. People are going to die if we go that extreme. So the idea of, oh, no more gas, no more gasoline. Well, everything I'm looking at your bookshelf and all these things behind you, mm. all these things have petroleum in yep, them. Yep, they yep. do. So we need to find a replacement. I agree. But starving ExxonMobil, instead of leaning on ExxonMobil to lead us to renewable, to lead the charge, ironically, Chevron is one of the biggest renewable participants, mm. and we're shunning Chevron because they're fossil fuel. 
we're going to, you can't get to the future of energy without present energy. That's one of my underlying sort of thoughts. Okay. Um, you know, as, as we talked earlier before we went on, and I think it's common for most people to say, I agree with, you know, the goals of environment, so social and governance. Uh, you know, it's just that, you know, I disagree in the methods and all that, but I've come to a new opinion, uh, Mark, which is I, I disagree. No, I disagree. I disagree because you can't even tell me what is the goal of the E. You can't even tell me what is the goal of S. And if the ESG cheerleaders are not protesting in the street to stop the destruction of human life in Ukraine, previously in Yemen, and in many other places around the world, which of course, led by US in most cases, if you're not yeah. out protesting the destruction of life, then what, what are you doing? What, what is your S? Make everybody happy at work or you know, have a certain number of males or females, or is it what? So I've gotten to a point now where my starting point is, I disagree. Yeah. Um... There's a lot of, you know, Andrew, you and I come from a critical thinking perspective mm. and, you know, we look at things from our backgrounds and our, our, our style of approach. What, what is measurable, right? And I would say in the E, S, and G trifecta, the E aspect to me is sort of the most measurable, right? You can actually measure carbon and uh, carbon, carbon in the you know I, I work with some farms down here in mm. Atlanta, Georgia, and you can you you can measure the soil, and you can measure the carbon amounts, and this nitrogen, and the sequestration, and the use of water, and the runoff, the cleanliness of the runoff into the into the water basin, so to speak. So you can actually measure that, and those are the kinds of things where you can point and say, I installed this, I used this new natural fertilizer, and reduced water consumption, and sequestered carbon. That's measurable. But when we talk about the social, Andrew, you and I could think about six different social things and your top six are not going to be my top six. And there's no universal measure of goodness. You and I sit in a certain spot and we say, oh, I got to recycle, which we can. We probably have the luxury to afford it. Let's assume someone in the third world, do they have the ability and the time to separate their plastics? They're worried about feeding their kids. They can't be like, oh, plastic bottles are my most important thing. That's environmental. But still, in terms of social and governmental issues, in governance, there's no universal measure. Mm. And there's, we can, you and I can have an opinion. Oh, we need major diversity across all aspects of our business. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Some people might say, I want the smartest people and who are going to contribute. I want diversity, but I need someone who can, you know, do high, high end math, let's say. That's the first factor. So in terms of measuring the goodness, that's an impossibility. And in terms of sort of knowing that it impacts a company is even harder. I mean, being an analyst is hard to say that, oh, they had 23 more people in, uh, who were from seven different backgrounds that added to our bottom line. That's a supposition. That's not really like a, a quantifiable measure. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I agree in the theories of ESG and what they stand for. I don't agree in the practices and how they're measured and how people are sort of putting feelings, feelings above facts on some mm -hmm. level. And I think that's a troubling aspect of ESG for me. Um, the other thing that um, I can't really figure out how to resolve is that I really think that the ESG folks have uh, co-opted the G which is governance. And governance is all about a pretty simple thing, agency theory, where an investor is putting money into a company without really any ability to know what's going on in that company. And therefore, they need some structures in place to make sure that their interests are being represented as best as possible. And that is just a simple shareholder capitalism um, structure in place, just like we have a stock market. There's a structure for trading. And the governance structure is something that I think is, you know, an important thing for shareholder capitalism. And so one of my questions is like, 
do we even do ESG a disservice ourselves when we're talking about it by allowing it to co-op the G with the E and S? So that's a great one. And, and let me just, I'm going to give an example here. So Silicon Valley Bank, it's a bank. They had no risk manager for eight months prior to their collapse. Okay, so when I look at the 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 the, the um, tripod E S and G of S V B Silicon Valley Bank, which by the way had a medium E S G risk before it collapsed, a medium. The three the three pillars E S G, a bank without a risk officer, that's a zero in G. That mm. is an absolute zero. So to me, that E S G stool, you don't sit in that one. It has no G. It's two legged stool. Mm. But the medium risk and what they said they were doing, well, we're supporting climate change and we're this and we're that. Everyone was like, oh, what an amazing story. Everyone piled into that. And then they got torched, right? Because there was no there was no G. So there was that misleading nature of, you know, the, the rating system. And I think what we've seen, and, and I'll give you another G example, governance within the company, okay? I used to like to use Hershey's. As an example, okay, mm. Hershey's is on an ESG push of sustainability. And they say, you know what? We need sustainable chocolate. So they have to go deeper into the cocoa producing areas, find the sugar that has those very strict sustainability aspects. So they got to go deeper, turn over more rocks. That costs more money. Now, as a consumer, do I go into the CVS or the local drugstore and say, I want a sustainable chocolate bar? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. For me, I don't go that granular and say, I need a sustainable chocolate bar. I don't need a lot of chocolate, but anyway. So has the ESG push raised costs? Yep, it has for Hershey's, they have to go deeper. And have they, has Hershey's asked the shareholders and said, hey, by the way, we're gonna pursue this. It's going to cost us more. And they also have to say, we're not even sure that it changes the consumption of our product. So in the end, that's where shareholders, stakeholders are involved. And they're basically subject to what Hershey's is being peer pressured into doing. Maybe the CEO does say, I want to do ESG sustainable chocolate. Maybe he does. Maybe the bank says, you got to lower your ESG profile in, 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 in the, the negative score or else you're not getting a good loan. So then they have to improve their ESG score. Again, they didn't really ask the shareholders and the um, cost of everything went up and it's margins compress. And it's harder to say that sales go up because of the sustainability. So there's a bit of capture there. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of conflict. <laughs> and I think that's part of the trouble too, is that, it, you know, look, Larry Fink, original ESG proponent, right? We're going to force behaviors at BlackRock. Well, they surely are forcing behaviors. <laughs> and I'm not sure it's for the benefit of everyone. And I think a guy like Larry Fink, he cares. If I had to rank the four things, AUM, power, fees, and ESG, I know which one's the fourth. I don't, know, I don't know about the other three, but I know ESG is last on that list of four. And so it's captured, it's conflicted, and it's a big force that we're that we're in the midst of. Um. One of the sad things about this is that we don't have too much time left, but I want to uh, touch on a couple of things. You know, when when I said that I disagree with ESG and I just disagree, I start from a point that I'm I'm going to ask people to define things. And when I ask people to define things, then you find that it, the, the definitions are not there. And so I, I, I no longer take... E and S, uh, environment and society on face value. I, I know, and now my my natural reaction is, uh, not. I, I don't. I don't. That the starting point is you must define. Now the other thing is, uh, some people would think, well, oh, Andrew, if you don't believe in these things, what's going to happen to the world? You know, companies are going to you know, spew out all this uh, you know gas and all that. Well, my one of my points in my twenty six reasons why I'm anti ESG is. ESG weakens, weakens democracy because what it does is people for some, you know, if, if you remember when, when we were young, Mark, 
no no respectable liberal would say that the capitalists are going to save us. And yet here we think that the capitalists, through their allocation of capital and through their companies, are going to bring us to a better future. Whereas what we really need to be doing is, uh, you know, putting pressure on our governments that are elected officials that we can also elect out if we disagree with their implementation of what they're doing. And what I'm saying is that ESG, the ESG movement is pulling people away from holding a government accountable to say, if we want less pollution in our city, as an example, we have to hold our government officials accountable. What are your thoughts on that? So unfortunately, we've seen in the US a real um, uh, weakening of the divisions of governance from the government and investing. It's become very corporately, in corporate governance intertwined in terms of how decisions are made, how they're handed down, and who is pulling what strings. And unfortunately, that's muddied the the investment landscape. I call it the investment landscape distortion. And to be honest, this really, to me, on some level, culminated with the you know last handful of years of the end of the bond market, bull market, if you will. In other words, as rates went to zero, the cost of taking risk went to zero. I mean, if if money is free, you can do all these things and pursue these measures and there's no real cost. And you can see that in 2022, last year, well, late 2021, but early 2022, the cost of capital was like, you know, two, the two year yield on January 1 of 2022 was around 75 basis points. It was really low. And so there was no real cost of, and Fed funds was, was low too. And so you could hire extra people. You could go out and hire a chief sustainability officer. And the government sort of was pushing this idea along with the Larry Finks of the world. We need diversity. We need to protect the environment. Climate change is coming. And because money was so free flowing, there was all this distortion going on. Oh, we need to hire some more people. Oh, okay, we got free money. We could do that. Then what happened in 2022, interest rates spiked dramatically in 12 hmm. months. And at the end of 22, you saw all these tech companies that had overhired, they laid off all these people, right? Because all of a sudden, wait, money was free and now it's not. And we hired all these people and our PL is suffering. The government encouraged us to expand this message. And then, wow, PL actually matters. Rates are higher, costs are higher. Like it's expensive to make an error. So I think that we've seen this sort of, I don't know, I'll call it a technocracy, a technocratic sort of environment now where, you know, a company like Facebook or Meta, excuse me, they're doing some of the government's heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And they're also, if they're doing that, they have to comply with diversity and all these different things to make sure they continue to stay in the good graces of the government. So to me, that, as I said, the, 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 the blurring of the lines has captured a lot of people. And I think now we have the regulators industry is a huge, right? it's a booming business. The, the fees collected in ESG um, you know, is, are in the billions now. <laughs> and we have more people. We, we have The growth industry is ESG hires. That's what it's been. And it's been a bit government aided and uh, play by the government rules and you'll be treated favorably. That's sort of what we've, what we've witnessed. Um, I, I just want to highlight one last thing from my side, and then I'm going to give you the last word to kind of, to wrap up. Uh, but one of the things that I like to think about is voluntary behavior and that we want to provide an opportunity for voluntary behavior. And if Hershey's wants to voluntarily decide, which it didn't, the only reason why Hershey's did this is because it got pressures of capital. But if Hershey's wanted to voluntarily say, we're building a sustainable supply chain with these features because we believe in this, do it. You know, so I'm all for it. And I think that there is an argument that it could be a great 
selling point. It could be a great actual corporate strategy that people could buy into that. But what I also have come to the opinion of recently is that the best way that we can handle this is we can say, if your decisions, your investment decisions of your company are based upon stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism, you need to clearly state that in your company bylaws. And I challenge any company who's voluntarily chain, you know, focused on the ESG type of stuff or sustainability, I challenge them today to change your bylaws, to put that in your bylaws that we are putting stakeholder capitalism above shareholder capitalism. And therefore we get to some truth about what you are doing. But I'm kind of an extremist now after talking to you, Mark, after, now I yeah. realize. Um, I'm gonna give you the last word and I want you to tell us about what we can find at or ESGorphans.com and Constrained Capital you know, uh, ETF. So let me turn it over to you as a final wrap up. Well, this, this actually is where it takes a little bit of a turn, Andrew. Um, I've my my ESG orphans index is I created. It's been it still trades. It's been around the um, the ESG orphans ETF itself actually uh, lived lived actually a short life. And I'm sorry to, to say that, mm. but um, as a businessman and a, and look a trader and an investor, um, you know I still have a pretty young family and this and that. I I I I created that ETF to mirror the index. And uh, just when when interest rates are now five percent, the equity risk premium is you know it's it's not as much there. And when Nvidia is trading at whatever thirty five yeah. times and it's up whatever two hundred percent or whatever it is this year, it's hard to compete. And so for me, uh, you know, it was a great idea and it is a great idea. And I still I still hold these stocks myself personally. Mm. But the ESG Orphan ETF itself, uh, I just shut it down because it's yeah. a very the ETF business is very saturated, very competitive, and it's just a tough business, a tough racket. The I've now been doing a lot of ESG consulting, yep. working with companies to helping them understand the risks. And when you know when they look at a company and say, "Is this company really doing ESG?" Well, if certain people have classified it as an ESG medium risk or low risk or whatever. I want to kick the tires. I want to mm. turn it over. I want to speak to people because I've spoken to people and I ask, you know, I've spoken to corporate execs and I've said, what's the story? Well, I'm filling out a due diligence questionnaire because they're asking me specific things and I got to check these boxes. Are they saying good or are they doing good? You know, and that is the big thing I've realized because, you know, when, when people buy something based on a, an analyst risk, well, have they done their own due diligence? Have they dug in to what that really means? Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time recently um, doing consulting work around ESG. And actually, one of the amazing things, I've, I've, I've connected with some farmers down here. And as I mentioned, the real ESG measurable. I'm working with some organic farms down here that are doing regenerative, sustainable farming. No pesticides, no, no, no uh, antibiotics kind of stuff. And- We've done soil tests and we've looked six months ago, where were they? Where are they now? And the use of what's called a new, a new fertilizer called biochar, which is an organic um, fertilizer that improves soil quality and water runoff. So those are things where I'm putting my work, my expertise to work in helping people understand and really improve real ESG measurable and not some pie in the sky, say good versus versus doing good because you know i'll give you one example i know we're running out of time but uh, last year exxon mobile's rating improved relative to tesla and people were up in arms and they didn't understand but what happened was exxon mobil offloaded public parcels to private equity less scrupulous private equity let's say definitely mm -hmm. less under under the radar if you uh, uh, yeah, under the radar so that the energy equation didn't change but what happened was Exxon offloaded some parcels and said, yes, we've reduced our oil and gas and their ESG rating went up. But in the reality, the net equation in the society didn't change. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff where I'm trying to help investors 
when they look at something and say, oh, this guy's doing ESG, they rate high. I say, you know, have you kicked the tires? Like, remember the, the SVB example? Yep. Is there a risk manager? Well, that's a pretty simple question. So <laughs> I'm trying, that's what I've been doing. Constrained capital is still a thing and it's still what I, you know, live under, so to speak. But, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed what I'm doing and uh, my passion is sort of making sure people understand risk and reward and are not misled by mm. an ESG saying everybody wins, nobody loses, it's costless and we're all benefiting. That just sounds too good to be true for me. And my truth in ESG is is where that uh, that analysis comes from. Well, to, to just wrap this up, I would say that to the listeners and the viewers out there, make a difference in this world, but do it in a way that makes a real difference, not in a way that's checking off boxes and all that. And what you're talking about and what I'm talking about, I don't want to be moralized, you know, people coming at me with all of their opinions about what I should do. I follow the laws and also I look for innovations to improve things. Uh, and so that's kind of the message that I, I get from you. And I'm going to wrap it up there, fellow risk takers. That was another great discussion uh, on an interesting topic. I think uh, there's a lot more to discuss on this topic, and I dare to discuss it. So uh, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, Mark, thanks for your time, and I'll see everybody on the upside.